Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Uh, as always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode 112 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next nearly half hour, I'm gonna be ranting away about you, uh, at you, at things interest to me that I think deserve your attention. Uh, any reactions to the show can be sent to me at whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can comment there, or you can get the email address from there. Uh, I do answer my email, sometimes I'm kind of slow about it, but you will get an answer. All right, with that, let me get to it. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, first, uh, there's something coming up in the next two or three weeks. The, uh, by the, uh, sometime around the end of the month, the Supreme Court is expected to issue its rulings on two cases that are significant for the area of marriage equality. One is whether or not to uphold California's Proposition 8, or Prop 8 as it came to be known, which stripped away a then existing right for same-sex couples to marry in California. The other is the question of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, a, uh, a section of which defines marriage as one man and one woman for all federal purposes, meaning that even couples who are legally married, same-sex couples, in one of the 12 states that do this, still can't get federal marriage benefits. Now obviously no one can say for sure what will happen, but legal observers are making their predictions. They're actually predicting that the court will strike down that section of DOMA that defines marriage as one man and one woman on the grounds that this creates two groups of legally married couples who are treated differently under federal law, which you can't do. Uh, as a result of that, legally married same-sex couples would have the same access to federal marriage benefits as any other couple. These same observers are also predicting that the court's going to punt on Proposition 8, that they're going to avoid reaching a decision. The result of that would be to leave intact the appeals court decision which struck down Proposition 8, allowing same-sex marriage to return to California, but would not affect the laws of any other state. All right, so with that, uh, those decisions coming up, I thought I'd take a couple of minutes to sketch out some recent news on this front because, as I've said any number of times, this is one area, maybe the only one, but this is an area on which we, the progressive we, the people who are interested in justice we, are actually winning. One example of that is how attitudes in California have changed since Prop 8 was passed in 2008. It was passed by a margin of 52 to 48. Well, according to a USC Los Angeles Times poll two years later in 2010, 52% of registered voters said that they approved of allowing same-sex marriage. Only 40% opposed it. That's a 12-point spread and a dramatic change from just a couple of years before. Now, three years after that, in 2013, another uh, USC LA Times poll shows 58% of California's registered voters approving same-sex marriage, only 36% against, that's a margin of 22 points, a gap 10 points wider than it was just three years earlier. The poll showed support for legal same-sex marriage increasing everywhere across every age group and in every area of the state. In fact, the change in the U.S. in general, not just in California, is notable enough that both supporters and opponents of same-sex marriage uh, are agreeing on something. It's going to happen. According to a recent poll by the Pew Research Center, three-quarters of Americans think that same-sex marriage will ultimately become legal. That includes 85% of people who support it and 59% of people who oppose it. Even places that have supposedly iced same-sex marriage out of the question entirely may be finding changes coming. Uh, for example, Michigan. This is one of these states that had adopted a state constitutional amendment, this is back in 2004, that defined marriage as one man and one woman. That vote passed by 58 to 42. But a poll released just last month found that 55% of likely voters in Michigan said that they would vote to amend the state's constitution to allow for same-sex marriage. That shift is clear enough that activists in Michigan are now planning a 2016 ballot drive to get something on the ballot to undo that amendment. 
In fact, even the traditional arguments against, against same-sex marriage are falling apart. Consider the famous, the Bible says line, the one that claims the Bible defines marriage as one man and one woman. In fact, it doesn't. The Bible, in fact, offers multiple descriptions of marriage. For example, it endorses polygamy. Both Abraham and David had multiple wives. In fact, 2 Samuel has God telling David, quoting, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Deuteronomy says that victims of rape have to marry their rapist. Genesis, Deuteronomy, and Ruth all say that a man is obliged to marry his brother's widow regardless of his own marital status. Ezra forbids interracial marriage and says that those who have already married foreign wives have to divorce them immediately. Paul said it's better not to marry at all and to live, live uh, as celibate. And the Gospel of Matthew has Jesus encouraging those who can to castrate themselves for the kingdom and to live a life of celibacy. So while it wouldn't be true to say that there's a biblical text that specifically allows for same-sex marriage, the argument that the Bible defines marriage as one man and one woman is utter and complete claptrap. But of course, that doesn't mean that the, uh, that the bigoted opposition will not continue. Just consider Illinois. The hope had been for a legislative victory there. The state senate had passed a same-sex marriage bill. The governor said he, was, he would sign it, but a vote in the state house of representatives has now been stalled until the fall. Well, it develops now that the Catholic Church is trying to financially force local groups in Illinois that work with the poor to oppose same-sex marriage. The groups in question received grants from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. Uh, this is the anti-poverty arm of the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They are also part of the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights. Well, on May 23rd, this coalition issued a statement in support of marriage equality for same-sex partners. In response, Catholic Church officials contacted the groups involved that received grants and told them that they either withdraw from the coalition and renounce its position in favor of same-sex marriage or they can forget about any funding. So faced with the choice between aid the poor and the immigrants and protect our bigoted notion about marriage, the Catholic Church has clearly made its choice. And in fact, you could consider all of that a um, very long introduction to one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given it for acts of meritorious stupidity. This one starts with the news that Tippy Canoe School for the Arts and Humanities in Milwaukee recently celebrated School Spirit Week with a variety of events for grades uh, K through eight. The student council chose Friday of the week to be Gender Bender Day, uh, a voluntary event, of, of event calling for boys to dress like girls and girls to dress like boys. And of course, some parents hit the roof. This was called ridiculous, creepy, the wrong lesson. It's having students dress as transvestites. And one particularly revealing comment, one mother claimed the event promotes the acceptance of homosexuality among students. And we all know what a terrible, horrible thing being accepting of homosexuals is. The school tried to cool things off by renaming the day Switch It Up Day, but of course that didn't work. Still what happened is the day came, it went, some participated, some didn't, and the world naturally did not come to an end. Now despite that, those parents are not the winners of the Big Red Nose this week. No, 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 that's just the backdrop. This week, the Big Red Nose goes to that supremo stupidity, that icon of idiocy, the clown's clown, Bill O'Reilly. When Gender Bender Day came up on his show, he denounced the school's teachers as his favorite and long since cliched epithet pinheads. He claimed the whole thing was a politically correct anti-bullying project, which shows typically just how uninformed he actually is. Remember, this was done by the student council, not by the teachers or the administration, and it was part of school spirit week. It had nothing to do with any anti-bullying campaign. But that level of ignorance is not enough for the high standards that BO usually sets. 
In response to his rant, his guest on the show said, I'm quoting, I have a six-year-old son, I have twins. He had to ride in his sister's pink car seat the other day for a mile, and he screamed like a stuck pig the entire time. Well, O'Reilly says, and this is a quote, that's a good sign. That's a good sign because if he had liked that, you might have to send him to camp. Yeah, that's right. According to Bill O'Reilly, if a boy likes pink, there's something wrong with him. He needs correction. He needs treatment. He needs to be sent to... Just what kind of a camp are you thinking of, Mr. O'Reilly? This kind of rigid, this doctrinaire, this sexist thinking, it's stupid, it's bigoted. This is the kind of thing that's damaging to children. It is the notion of a complete and absolute total clown. Oh, by the way, though, Apparently, according to Bill O'Reilly, if a boy likes a pink car seat, that's a sign of uh, something wrong with him. I wonder if the same thing applies to pink ties. All right, we got one time here for uh, one little quick, like sort of personal frustration thing before we go to break. A little over three years ago, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, commonly called Obamacare, was signed into law. During the months of the debate over the law, there were persistent polls saying a majority or at least a very sizable minority of the public was against it. To my personal frustration, those polls never asked the people who were against it why. When they finally got around to doing this several months into this whole debate, they discovered pretty consistently that about a third of those who said they were against it, generally about 16-18% of the total sample, uh, felt that way because the proposal was not liberal enough. It was not broad enough. It did not regulate the insurance industry enough. It did not provide enough access to health care. Bottom line, it just wasn't good enough. I was among those who felt that way, and I still do. Now, at the time, those of us who did think that way were denounced by those who supported the bill. We were fools, unrealistic, we don't understand politics. The quote at my blog saying, I live in a magical fantasy world, actually comes from that time. This is what can pass, we were told, and when it passes, people will actually love it. Well, as I said at the time, if you start by calling for what will pass, you will inevitably wind up at the end with less than you could have gotten, which of course is exactly what happened. Now, what brings this up is a CNN poll from the end of May that found 43% of Americans support Obamacare, 35% oppose it as too liberal, and 16% say it's not liberal enough, which is pretty much the same breakdown as there was three years ago when the bill was signed into law, so much for everybody will love it. But while that's what brought it up, this is why I brought it up. Something else that people like me were told over and over again at the time was that we should get on board with this bill because it was said, this is just the start. We'll come back next year. We'll make it better. We'll fight to improve it. Well, I said at the time, I predicted, said you won't be fighting for improvements. You'll be fighting just to protect what you've got against cutbacks and attacks. So I just want to say to everyone who said, we'll be back, said that in any form to anyone, I just want to say to those people, just where the hell have you been these past three years? Where are your campaigns for improvements? When does next year actually get here? If your real interest was in health care for everyone rather than a political victory for Barack Obama, I'm going to ask you again, just where the hell have you been? Saying I told you so actually never actually fixes anything, but it does help to relieve some frustration. Let's take a break. And there we are. Welcome back. Welcome back just in time for our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. You know, sometimes I think when you ask a government official, you know, at the federal and even at the state level about privacy, they, they'll think that you mean their privacy, that their ability to keep secrets, not yours. It's become a mixture to me of amazing and frightening how cavalierly government officials will propose programs that involve more and more tracking of individuals without it sometimes seems even realizing themselves the implication of what they're proposing. The latest example of this is the plan by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to no longer accept cash at Tobin Bridge uh, beginning early next year. 
Over the next several years, the department hopes to expand this uh, transition to electronic only payment to include not only the Tobin Bridge, but also the Mass Pike and the uh, Logan Airport tunnels. Oh, and aren't they all a flutter about all of the benefits accruing to us, the driving and riding public? Oh, it'll reduce congestion. You'll fly right through the toll plaza without even having to slow down. Isn't that wonderful? Not like having to slow down to a crummy 15 miles an hour to get through the toll plaza, or even horrors having to actually stop for a toll. This new system does away with toll booths entirely. It replaces them with overhead sensors that can read your EZ Pass. Uh, now, this system is currently used in 15 states, the EZ Pass system. It allows commuters, as you, I expect you know, to pass through toll booths without stopping because electronic sensors recognize the EZ transponder in your car and it charges your account for the toll, your account being linked to a debit or credit card. Okay, wait, what if you don't have an EZ Pass? Uh, well, in fact, the uh, state, uh, state Secretary of Transportation, his name is Richard Davey, he says, well, yeah, this will necessitate a widespread switch to Easy Pass. But that's no big deal, he says. We'll just give them away for free. See? Problem solved. All right, what if you still don't have an Easy Pass? Well, cameras will capture the license plates of drivers who don't have passes, and they'll get a bill in the mail. The state estimates that this $120 million project, once it's fully implemented, will save the state around $50 million a year, most of which will come from firing three quarters of the people who now work in the toll booths. All right, so let's run it down. In order to provide you the enormous, the incalculable benefit of not having to slow down at a toll booth, the state is proposing a program that involves throwing 300 people out of work, essentially requiring you to have a credit or debit card account to which the state has access, with the alternative of having to essentially pay a penalty, the return postage on the bill you're going to get. And here's the privacy part, enabling the state to create, if it chooses, a database of every car that uses the Mass Pipe, the Tobin Bridge, or the Logan Tunnels, including when it was there and where on the pike it was. Now, the program, I think, is bad enough. But the idea that it enables the state to build that sort of citizen tracking database is an utter outrage. And the fact that it's possible that state officials honestly didn't even think of this when they proposed it is an even bigger one. All right, I'm going to wrap up with this. And you have to know, I was going to talk about this. You have to know, the big news of the past week has been the twin revelations about massive warrantless surveillance of Americans. One, the first revelation was that the federal government has been actively and secretly collecting the telephone records of every telephone call, both landline and mobile, made within the U.S. or into the U.S. or out of the U.S. Data about all your phone calls is being sucked up by the federal government and stored for later retrieval. Now, this kind of thing has been reported before, and true, and in fact, I've already mentioned it twice on this show. I mentioned it a year ago, May, and again last September. But two things broke through the ho-hum reaction that these reports usually get. One was that it was the first clear evidence that the Obama administration was continuing and even expanding the sweeping surveillance of Americans that the Bush gang initiated. And second, this time there was a smoking gun. The Guardian, a leading newspaper in the United Kingdom, got hold of a copy of the court order requiring Verizon, it, was, it authorized a three-month renewal of an order uh, requiring Verizon to turn over to the feds records on, quote, an ongoing daily basis. These records that Verizon has to turn over don't include the content of the calls, but they do include what number you called from, what number you called, when you called, the routing information of the call, which reveals where both you and the other person were at the time you made the call, and how long you talked for every single Verizon phone call in the United States. It doesn't include the content? Fine. As even Joe Biden pointed out, you don't have to listen to the content of the calls to create a picture of your life that is, quoting him, very, very intrusive. Now, the court order obtained by The Guardian only mentions Verizon specifically, uh, 
But it would be bizarre to imagine that the other phone companies are not getting the same sort of orders. Uh, and in any event, NBC News soon reported that this actually involved all phone calls in the United States. And all of this is being done without even making a pretense of the individualized suspicion that is a hallmark of what's required by the Fourth Amendment. Now that report about the blanket collection of data on all phone calls was quickly followed by the revelation of a program codenamed PRISM. PRISM involves connecting directly into the central servers of nine leading U.S. internet companies, those being Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, PalTalk, AOL, Skype, YouTube, and Apple, with Dropbox, which is a cloud storage and synchronization service, being described as coming soon. From these outfits, the NSA can extract audio, video, photographs, emails, documents, and connection logs. What's really remarkable about this story is that uh, National, uh, Director of National Intelligence James Clapper actually acknowledged the existence of the program. Now, all the companies here uh, have denied involvement. Some say, I, you know, I never even heard of PRISM. But they may be hanging those denials on a very thin nail. The documents that, uh, that were obtained describing the program refer to being plugged into the company's central servers. But another classified report says that the NASA, uh, at the NSA rather, collection managers, as they're called, can send instructions to equipment installed at company-owned lo uh, owned locations. That is, the NSA can't send orders directly to the company's central computers, their central servers, only to e their own equipment that is attached to the central servers. Uh, in terms of the issue at hand, that's what I like to call a distinction without a difference. Now, PRISM obviously involves collecting content. In fact, in the case of a Skype call, it can include both the audio and video. Because of that, the spooks have to at least make a nod in the direction of constitutional protections, especially since the NSA is barred by law as well uh, from actual surveillance of Americans within the U.S. It's only supposed to surveil foreigners. So PRISM is not a sweeping dragnet like the phone call thing is. The fact is, the NSA can pull out anything it likes out of a company's data stream, but it doesn't try to get it all. Instead, what's happening is that analysts are keying in search terms, which are designed, they say, to produce at least a 51% confidence in a target's foreignness, which is hardly what you would call a stringent standard. In fact, uh, in a great line, John Oliver said on The Daily Show, this is flipping a coin plus 1%. The result is that even when no Americans are actually being targeted by this, the NSA routinely collects a great deal of information about Americans. That's described as incidental. And in fact, training materials for new analysts tell them to just don't worry about it. But of course, they should worry about it. It is something to worry about, especially because analysts are typically taught to chain through two, uh, two hops, what they call, out from the target. What that means is you've got a target. You sweep in everybody in their inbox and outbox, everybody in all of those people's inboxes and outboxes, and everybody in all of those people's inboxes and outboxes. And the incidental collection of information expands exponentially. This is six degrees of separation played out in the real world. The response of the White House to all this uh, was not surprisingly that this is all perfectly legal, it's all according to law, there's nothing to see here, um, move along, go back to watching The Bachelorette or, or whatever. Um, in fact, the amazing Mr. O insisted that the program is essential. In fact, remember, remember what I said last week, I was talking about the, uh, the DNA. Uh, program, the, the swabs, uh, I said, did you ever notice how as soon as one of these tools is available to, the, to these people, it suddenly becomes essential, they have to have it or the whole world will fall apart? Well, Obama said that these programs are essential to combating terrorism. Quoting him, the program, quoting, may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. Excuse me? That is, again, the program may identify potential leads 
with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. How many more weasel words can you fit into one sentence? And if you're looking to Congress for relief, don't. One thing the White House is right about is that members of Congress uh, knew about this. Every member of Congress, particularly every member of the Senate, was informed of this. Now, a few of them, uh, uh, in particular, uh, Senators Ron Wyden and Mark Udall, they tried to raise the alarm about this. But the fact is that members of Congress, particularly in the Senate, had multiple opportunities to either rein in this program or at least impose some transparency or some restrictions. They had multiple occasions and they failed to do so time and time again. They were willing, most of them anyway, were willing to sacrifice the rights and privacy of the public rather than risk being accused of voting against national security or being soft on terrorism. So what you heard instead from the leaders in the Senate in particular was a whole boatload of CYA. Senator Dianne Feinstein, who chairs the Senate Intelligence Committee, said, I know that people are trying to get to us. This program is called Protecting America. Senator Saxby Chambliss, ranking member of the committee, said, this is nothing particularly new, a sentiment echoed by Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who said, everyone should just calm down. This isn't anything that's brand new. So in other words, you're saying it's been going on for several years, like that's supposed to make me feel better. Senator Lindsey Graham, demonstrating his usual gasp, uh, grasp of reality, said he was glad the NSA is collecting the phone records. Because, but then he says, you can't just track people. You've got to have some belief that the person being surveilled is connected to terrorism, which is exactly what this phone program does not do. The guy's such a twerp. In fact, Representative Jim Sensenbrenner, he's a conservative Republican who was one of the authors of the provision of the Patriot Act that they're using to say this whole thing is legal, says it's not. He actually wrote a letter to Attorney General Eric Holder in which he said, how could the phone records of so many innocent Americans be relevant to an authorized investigation as required by the act? The fact is, it can't. But don't expect Congress to do a damn thing about it. Not when that would involve admitting how badly they had screwed up for how long. There's a lot more that needs to be said about this. I really don't have time this week, but I'm going to be talking more about this week. I'm talking, going to be talking about the hero who released this stuff. There's a lot more to talk about. I'll get to it next week. But for right now, I need to close with our weekly reminder. As of June 11th, at least 4,924 people have been killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown, at least 46 of them in Massachusetts. You have the best week you possibly can. Enjoy the weather as best as you can. I will see you next week. Be safe.